Right, thank you very much. A few things to say. If, if, if I said I understood half of what those previous two talks are about, I'd think I'd be a blatant liar. So I'm not a developer, I'm not a coder. I think I left my coding days behind me back in about 1984 with the Spectrum 48K, um, when I realized that actually I got fed up of typing in those really long pages of code only to find you made a spelling mistake halfway through. And I thought, screw that, <laughs> let's play Jetpack instead or Manic Miner. But <clears throat> what I'm here today to talk to you about is actually um, I'm an information security professional, so I'm the director of global, the Global Security Office for Sapient. So let's move on first off to a little disclaimer. So uh, I'm actually not allowed to talk about specific things that we do within Sapient. Um, this is great for me because when you break into rapturous applause at the end, it's because it's all my own work. And if you hate it, it's because my damn company won't let me talk about the things I really need to talk about. Um, but I am glad to say that actually what I'm going to put across now is some concepts and some ideas. It's more of a conversation than anything else rather than a, a talking at you. Um, but it's, you know, I'm trying to in introduce some ideas about how actually secure coding or coding with security in mind is actually vital. It's really, really important, but not necessarily for the reasons that you might think. Um, so we're going to talk about, for instance, how coding securely can save money. It's kind of an obvious thing in a sense. You don't, you don't do so much rework, you know, hacks later on, blah, blah, blah. We're going to look into that in more detail. But, you know, this is probably in anybody who's in some, any kind of commercial organization, the better you code, the more money you will save and the more money that the shareholders make or your bosses make or whatever, right? And that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. Their success is your success. We all, I'm sure we all agree with that. <clears throat> now, what this image does remind me of actually, it's a slight segue, but I have to say, whenever I do a presentation like this, I do an awful lot of Google image searches and you're trying to find the right kind of image. And I have to say, over the past few months, the, not only the quality and the resolution of the images has, has increased, but the actual quality of the subjects of the images has increased. And I think it's, I think it's you know, just, like, as I say, a little segue, it's something that's worth bearing in mind, especially as we move on to the next point about how we can, you know, secure coding helps us actually not only lose confidence in, in things, but also will help us build confidence as well. And I think that's an important concept. Confidence not only within ourselves, but also within the... Uh, our clients and our employers, etc. And the third thing we're going to talk about is we can save lives with this stuff. This is important. The Internet of Things, that wonderful TLA that everybody's starting to hear more and more about, it, this is an important concept. You quite literally can save lives with the right kind of coding done in the first place. We're going to look at some examples you know, around that. Yeah, so without uh, further ado, let's move on to um, saving money. So Sony, and I've just noticed that my laptop is not giving me any of my notes whatsoever. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of you know, wing it a little bit now. But Sony, we all know about the Sony breach back in 2011 uh, as carried out by uh, Anonymous and members purporting to be of Anonymous. And they took something like, I don't know, 76 million records, I think it was, personal records. Um, the uh, cost to Sony as a result of that was in the hundreds of millions, without a shadow of a doubt. Not only in actually reputational damage, uh, but also in the fact that uh, um, they had to, you know, with credit card information potentially being stolen, they had to pay, um, you know, restitutional damages to people and that, that kind of thing. And do you know what the, the primary cause of that hack was? Does anybody have an idea of that? No, 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 it was even before that. It was just public. SQL injection. It was a SQL injection attack that allowed Anonymous to get in there in the first place and then capitalise on those other things, if you see what I mean. So, yes, the hack would probably have happened <coughs> through other means and mechanisms, but the primary entrance point into this was SQL injection. It was a coding error. 
you know. So, and I, you know, the SQL injection is just one example, you know, and I'm sure everybody in this room never codes insecurely and has never coded a SQL injection error in their lives, of course, but uh, far bit for me to say. But I think SQL injection has been on the OWASP top 10 for 10 years, 12 years, something like that. You know, this is, this is a, 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 a vulnerability that should be, well, shouldn't be around in, in today's day and age. So, you know, I think, you know, the Sony hack started with a SQL injection. Let's try LinkedIn. This was a more common one. Again, to your point, it's because LinkedIn did not, they encrypted their passwords, they didn't hash and salt them. So they were very easily reversed, effectively. But the first entry point into the LinkedIn hack was a SQL injection attack through a third party application that LinkedIn used. Again, very, very simple, basic um, pieces of, of attack or, or pieces of, of vulnerabilities were exploited to carry out this. Now, this was a far smaller scale. LinkedIn, obviously, is a free product for 99% of the people out there. Their margins are paper thin. It cost them about two to three million dollars to, to get this fixed, to get it squared away. They exposed, I think it was something like eight million records, something like that. Uh, if I had my notes on my laptop, I'd be able to tell you far more accurately. Uh, note to self, check laptop before starting. Um, so, but this is a, a, you know, another example. And the third example I want to give, obviously quite an obvious one, target. Everybody knows about this. This one isn't SQL injection, you'll be glad to hear. But this, this actually took advantage of a vulnerability within the POS systems. Now, somebody coded those POS systems, right? There is, you know, those POS systems were coded by somebody who actually wrote the, the, the uh, production code that they used, and a vulnerability within that code was exploited, which then allowed uh, folks to, the, um, the attackers, I think they were Russian allegedly, to scam the credit cards of, you know, millions of customers. They reckon that the actual total damages uh, will come to billions in the end. Um, they act that the target posted a loss in earnings in the uh, I think it was the following one or two quarters, which for target that's a big deal. I mean, you know, when you're reporting to the street on a quarterly basis, you know, missing your targets by quite significant amounts is a big deal. Shareholder value goes down, etc. You know, it's it's actually quite a, a quite a quite a problem to say the least. So these are examples, you know, where I say actually secure coding in the first place saves money. Okay, fair enough. Saves money, reputational damage. Okay, big deal. No problems. Well, let's look at losing confidence side. Now, this is not quite as clear cut as it might seem. Now, HB Gary, uh, and more specifically, HB Gary Federal, was an, a, a governmental uh, security, or I rephrase that, a security company that served the US government's uh, uh, space as it were. You can't find a logo for HP Gary Federal anymore. I think they've, they've invoked their right to be forgotten or something, but HP Gary. Now in 2011, their CEO, a chap called Aaron Barr, and I don't, you know, tell, if anybody, please nod vigorously if anybody remembers this or knows this. Their CEO, Aaron Barr, a chap who I happen to know, quite incidentally, lovely fella, um, he basically went to the Telegraph, I think it was. He's an American chap, but he, he, he got his, his point out through the telegraph saying I know how to identify anonymous through social media you know the hacker group anonymous I can put names to them it was quite a grandiose claim and it put anonymous on a bit of a back foot for a short period of time they then attacked HB Gary using what SQL injection, SQL injection. so they attacked the HB Gary CMS they went through the website attacked the CMS now that was just the first point. There was a litany of errors after that. They got into the CMS through SQL injection. Through, the, through that, the passwords were poorly encoded using, a, uh, using a, I think it was a SHA-1 hash, a very, a very you know, low quality, known to be bad uh, hashing algorithm. So they got the password table. They managed to you know, um, use the rainbow tables to, to decrypt that effectively. Um, <clears throat> they then found passwords for the CMS for folks like Greg Hogland and Aaron Barr and other key leads within the HB Gary organization. HB Gary then fell over again because they had password reuse. They were constantly using the same passwords from account to account to account. So they were able to use those passwords to get further into the system. They then used social, classic social engineering. <clears throat> they got onto the, one of their third party developers who maintained the CMS and pretended to have forgotten their username 
blah, blah, blah. You know, can you open this port because I'm traveling in Spain, etc. And then got access and basically released every single email that was in the HP Gary system um, you know, to, I think it was uh, Pastebin. Um, and each one of these, <coughs> each one of these emails was basically saying how um, HP Gary were going to socially engineer it such that they could identify um, key members of Anonymous, and they were going to plant false information within the press. They were going to plant false information around the world. It was somewhat shady stuff, to say the least. Um, and so, bottom line is. Confidence was lost. A year later, HB Gary was HB Gary Federal. I'm sorry, uh, did not meet uh, their projection, their earnings projections, and were bought out and effectively asset stripped uh, a year later by another American company. So they were gone, quite simply gone. HB Gary Federal does not exist as it currently stands. <clears throat> so that's a classic example of something where um, you know poor coding, as well as a litany of other errors results in the, the loss of a company. Maybe a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where you stand with Anonymous and where you stand with what HP Gary were doing. But nonetheless, people lost their jobs. You know, people got behind on their mortgage payments, etc. However, <clears throat> let's look at this in a broader context. So from the Information Security Breaches Survey, it was carried out by the UK government, the uh, Department for Business Innovation and Skills. The actual cost of a breach is going up year on year. The number of breaches reported are going down, but the cost of a breach is going up. A large company, 600K to, to 1.15 million per breach is the average here. That's a lot of chunk of change that's being lost. For a small company, and that could be roughly 20, 80, 100 people, 65 to 115K. How many more widgets or things or consultancy that do you have to do to make up that kind of cost as a result of breaches into your organization? This is, this is quite a big deal. It's quite a big deal. But here's the rub. Here's the rub. 10% of every company that was surveyed for this had to completely change their business model as a result of being attacked. They either had to exit you know, their, their internet strategy or, or their, their, their uh, e-commerce strategy. They had to completely change how they operated as a result of the hack. 10%, that's quite a significant amount, if you will. Now, the interesting part is, when you look at some of the other companies that are involved in here, so we look, let's go back to Sony. If we go back to Sony, Sony were hacked a total of four times. Or actually, they were hacked once, four times if you see what I mean. It's the same hack every time. They didn't fix the breach. 2008, big global downturn. Sony's uh, share price went down, just like every other company's share price went down. When the breach happened and the subsequent breaches happened, their share price went even lower. So their share price at that point was a quarter of what it was about 15 to 18 months before prior. Uh, prior. It was a significant drop. Only now are they just recovering pre-breach levels. But hands up here, who has bought a Sony product since 2011? You probably bought one that you didn't know about. Now, my question is, what are you doing? This is an insecure company. Why are you buying products from an insecure company? I'll tell you why, because they do good products. So the interesting thing is just because a company gets a breach and suffers and drops share price, many times and more often than not, it does not result in that business disappearing. HP Gary was a very specific example. When you start searching for businesses that have actually gone out of business or organizations have gone out of business as a result of breaches, there's not many out there. It's quite interesting. Some statistics say that if a company handles its breach correctly, uh, Buffer, the uh, Buffer app, the folks who allow you to uh, 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 broadcast on social media across multiple platforms, they handled their breach incredibly well so that their actual market share took off after the breach. Now, I don't know what, what the cause of their breach was. Uh, I'm not even going to suggest it was SQL injection at this time. But their business actually took off. So it's not quite as simple as you might think. 
Yes, you might lose money. Yes, you might lose shareholder value. You know, yes, you might have a, a little bit of reputational damage. But very often, when you think about Sony, you don't think about them any differently now to what you did before. So this brings about a little bit of a conundrum. I can't say to you guys, as a developer community in front of me, if you don't code securely, we're all going to be out of a job. It's a little bit more complex than that. It's going to reduce value. It may result in short-term redundancy. It may result in a downturn, but it's not going to be the end of the world. So let's actually then, let's look at a different concept, saving lives. Does anybody know what this device is? It's, a, it's an insulin pump. So for people who have type 1 diabetes, uh, and particularly aggressive forms of it, uh, the, the pump is, is basically plumbed into their blood supply. It checks their, the blood sugars, and every time the blood sugars drop to a certain level, the pump activates and pushes insulin into their system automatically. It means you don't have to constantly check your blood yourself and keep doing it. Very good, especially if you're forgetful. This is a Bluetooth uh, pump, so you can actually on your smartphone monitor what's going on and gather a record and things like that. Now, in 2008, a chap called uh, Barnaby Jack, the late Barnaby Jack, he, he died, uh, I think it was uh, last year, uh, he showed at the DEF CON conference how actually there are such fundamental vulnerabilities in this device that someone within a 30-foot range could, with relative ease, hack into it and deliver a fatal dose of insulin to the individual. Now, now tell me that secure coding isn't important when you put it in context like that. We put all of our emphasis into securing credit cards and making sure money isn't lost, uh, you know, making sure that you know, shareholder value is increased. All of this stuff is inherently replaceable and, as we've seen, actually doesn't have that much of an impact. But when we start talking about the Internet of Things, this is a significant thing. Secure code, I'm not so, you know, I, I, I don't even know if anybody here is coding on any, any platform like this. But the vulnerabilities were so basic that actually it was very, very straightforward to do. Barnaby Jack obviously also went on and, and showed how uh, the standalone ATMs that connect over a, a GSM signal, they can also be hacked in the same way and you can start churning out as many, you know, you can route the, uh, the, the ATM and, and, and give out money. They haven't fixed this. These vulnerabilities still exist in Bluetooth um, insulin pumps in the world. Those vulnerabilities still exist. Does anyone know what this is? Go on, take a guess. Come on. Pacemaker. pacemaker there we go. This is one of those smart pacemakers. It's a type of one that Dick Cheney had. Um, now, whatever your political views, he actually took a very sensible precaution because these pacemakers have become wireless, effectively. It used to be you had to almost, a bit like a, 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 an access badge, you had to actually place a wand over the chest, sorry, chest, in order to um, uh, access the data that's held on the pacemaker, etc. Now it can be done from 20 metres away. He actually had the wireless capability on his pacemaker disabled because the Secret Service, not that they're paranoid or anything, but the Secret Service said, you are at risk. So he actually had that functionality disabled. He had to have you know, wires hanging out of his body to, in order for the pacemaker to be monitored, etc. Barnaby Jack again, the late Barnaby Jack again, he showed how from 20 feet away you can deliver a fatal electric shock to somebody's heart through a pacemaker. Now, again, putting things into perspective, one, not many people have pacemakers. Two, not many people actually have wireless pacemakers. I think they're all a bit traditional. If you fast forward 10 years, this kind of thing is going to be standard. We look at cars. We look at Tesla, for instance. You know, they, that te a car manufacturer offers a bug bounty for vulnerabilities in its code. Right? That's a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> when you, if you go back five years and said, you know, in five years' time, a car manufacturer will be offering bug bounties for it, for the, for the code that sits in its car. But what, really? But they're doing that. The Toyota Prius has been shown that it can be taken over. The, they can, um, from a car driving behind it, they can take over the, I think it's the, the, the lights and the horn and the um, indicators, etc. Not particularly 
you know, difficult, not particularly dangerous as such, but that's just stage one. This is just a research project, right? What next? And the Prius, although it's, you know, technically a fairly complex car, it's quite dated in, as, it, as regards technology. You've got BMWs now that you can control either iPhone. Um, you know, who knows what could happen next? You've got drive-by-wire steering. You know, somebody could take you off the road. This is where the future of secure coding is going to be, not just in websites, not just in things that might affect people's credit cards or things like that. This is where the future of it. Again, I want to emphasize, we put a lot of our effort into securing people's financial um, lives, which are completely replaceable and not putting enough effort into doing things that actually will take lives in the future. So where, where are the priorities that we should be looking at? Is it Internet of Things? Is it the cash? I don't know. This is not, a, this is not a, uh, a right or wrong description. I think it's more food for thought about how you as developers can view the work that you do, not just the work that you are doing today, but actually how you approach it as a developer. Developers, you're all developers. There are millions of lines of code in everything. You know, and one QA team or one testing uh, environment cannot go through every single line of code that's written. But each individual developer could go through every single line of code that they write and ensure that it's actually, to the very best of their knowledge, secure, properly written, you know, and as robust as it possibly could be. So let's talk about the takeaways here, because actually, at the end of the day, it's all very well, Tom, but, you know, actually, so what? What, what have we got to do about it? Well, I think there's three things that we can look at here. <clears throat> the first one, let's start coding more maturely. This is my humble opinion, you know, and I welcome any kind of suggestions otherwise. The logo, on, you're probably familiar with the one on the right. The logo on the, on the left is BSIM. The, um, it's bringing security uh, in maturity model. So it's about actually uh, ensuring that the way that an organization codes and manages its, its development environment has a maturity, actually has the checks in place. It's not, it's, it's not a standard as such. It is quite literally that a, a maturity model that allows you to measure how you as an organization might actually see where your code is compared to others. So we've got some big names in there, some of the big banks, I know Marks and Spencers, for instance, are part of the BSIM environment. It's kicked off by an organization called Sigital. It's actually technically a not-for-profit uh, organization. Although there are, you know, money does change hands, it's, it's at a sort of break-even point, to say the least. But you can start to measure the maturity of your development environment. And on the right, of course, the OWASP. The OS top 10, they've graced our shores for a, a you know, decade or whatever. Um, OSP is very good, but of course, you know, they bring out the top 10 every couple of three years. They might not be your top 10. That's the problem with this. This is such a generic thing. I think OS do a great job and they, they're doing an awful lot to bring this to our attention. But it's a generic thing. Their top 10 is not necessarily your top 10. You might have two or three on there. You know, SQL injection is on there still. Um, but you need to look at your coding priorities in the same way that they do. What, are you, what is your top 10? What are the 10 things that actually cause 90, 95% of the vulnerabilities within the, within the code that you produce? How do you actually route that out right at the very beginning rather than having to you know, pick apart the code at the end? So code more maturely. Look at different ways that you can actually address this. The third one is skin in the game. Now, this is a, uh, a Roman bridge, uh, and I don't know if people know this. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's an urban myth. I don't think it is. But in Roman times, they built good bridges. I mean, we can tell that by the modern bollard in front, you know, and the fact that this bridge is still standing, and, you know, if nothing else, grass is growing on it, you'd probably walk over the top of it, however many hundreds of years later. But one of the reasons why it's still there is because the architect who designed it had some real skin in the game. And he had skin in the game because he was forced to stand underneath the arches as the supporting structures were taken away once the bridge was completed. So that's a bit like saying you need to code, you need to write the code for this um, uh, insulin pump 
and then we're going to plug it into you and have a right old pop at that insulin pump. And as long as you're confident that you're not going to keel over in some kind of shock, th that's the equivalent, right? I'm not suggesting that, maybe. But <clears throat> what I'm saying, have some skin in the game. Have a sense of, you know, of responsibility of what you're doing. This is not just a job. Nobody's in here, I would suggest, because it's just a job. I think most people in this room have a passion for what they do. You wouldn't actually be, it's what, eight o'clock? You wouldn't be here in an office at eight o'clock at night listening to some, you know, Pratt talk about coding and secure coding if you didn't have a passion for it in the first place. Turn that passion into the code and the code that you deliver. Put some skin in the game to it. And remember, I think this is a very important thing to remember, that every time you write code, Just think of that knock on the door at 2 o'clock in the morning. All right, the next person who's got to look at your code, who's actually got to fix it, if they know where you live and they're particularly unhappy and a little bit unhinged, you might code a little bit harder. Just think of it in those terms as well. Again, very, I know it's a very blasé thing to say, but it's, it's true. You do need to actually think about it in these terms. It's not just an activity for now. It's not just an activity to get you to the next pay job, pay roll, sorry, your next payday. It's an activity. This code could be in production for decades in some cases. You know, or even if it's only in production for three years, but you've left the country and migrated to, emigrated to Australia to become a sheep farmer, how the hell are they going to be able to work out your code if you're not actually coding it in a way that can be understood and in a way that is robust and actually easily, um, easily deconstructed? And that is the end of it. It's my various internet residencies. If anybody would like to chat to me after, now, we'll take questions now, but thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. What are your tips on how best to educate ourselves in new vulnerabilities aside from OASP and those things are there? Good courses, good blogs. So OASP is a good place to start. The Sands Institute run very good courses. Um, they will work you hard. Their courses start on a Saturday morning um, and then run through to the following Friday in many cases. Um, so the Sands Institute is a very, very good place to go. Um, otherwise, I, th I mean, I think that would be my top tip is look at the Sands Institute. They're, they're also an open institute. They'll point you in other directions as well. Um, engaging, honestly, communities like this, you're already one step ahead by the fact that you're actually engaging in a community that cares about what you do. Um, there's also organisations, for instance, even ISACA and ISE Squared, they have specialities when it comes to coding and development. Um, you know, Google is your friend, to be honest with you, in many of these cases. But, yeah, very good point. I, I, my first place would be the Sands Institute. Yes. Any tips about how one would audit their codes in a manner which is not um, the extreme? So when you say audit, people think, geez, thousands of lines. But just in a, let's just go through and how you'd structure an audit. Yeah, very quite challenging. No, I do carry out audits and assessments, but yeah. not on code, as you probably gathered. Yeah. Not unless it's got a rubber keyboard. I might have a chance with actually understanding what you're writing. But um, very but challenging. Almost a mindset. Yeah. Now, there are various tools out there. And in fact, one, and coincidentally, it's from a, an organization called Sigital again. They have an application that will actually sit on top of your coding platform, whatever that might be. Um, and obviously, it's got to be customized for that particular platform. And as you write code, if it detects a vulnerability, it will actually highlight it and tell you why it's, a, why it's vulnerable, what its implications are and tell you what you should do to fix it. And obviously, you can ignore that because it might be out of context, etc. But it's, it's a bit like, um, you know, oh, I see you're trying to write a letter. Clippy coming up and telling you, you know, oh, I see you're, you're coding a SQL injection. Would you like some help? Um, it's kind of like that concept, maybe a little bit cleverer. That I have to like say. That sounds like the law developers into a false sense of security. Into? A false sense of security. Uh, yes, it could do. It could do, but it, but if nothing else, because if if, if uh, that code is reviewed two weeks, two months later, and then taken back to the developer, going, I don't know. But this is real time feedback, I think, in that particular case. As regards, um, 
I'm not sure I've got a particularly strong answer for you as regards auditing. It's not my, it's not my uh, strength. But you know, vulnerability assessments. You know, you can code review, code analysis reviews. A lot of automated tools, a lot of manual tools. My team is based in Miami and uh, Gurgaon in India, and they do a lot of this stuff for me. You know, you know, I make up for my lack of knowledge by hiring other people who know more than me. So, uh, but yeah, that's the best I, I can offer. Sorry, you had a question. Oh, you're just waving. Yes. <laughs> Yes, but Metasploit, uh, which is basically HD Moore, uh, and, and everything complies to HD Moore, Moore's law. There's a phrase that's bandied around the security arena, which is basically you must be this tall to ride the internet, which is effectively, if you can com if you can code effectively against Metasploit, you will code out 90% of the security threats out there because. Anybody can pick up Metasploit and load modules in and, you know, script kiddies, etc. That's by volume, not necessarily by threat, but by volume, that's what you're getting off. So actually, that's, it's, you're right, it is Metasploit, but it actually does get rid of a vast number. There are plenty of other areas for, for code reviews, but it, it is, you know, it is that height chart of, of being able to ride on the internet. So. Yeah. Well, that was, that was, you know, HD Moore has done, you know, so much good for, you know, web security and internet security. But the flip side, of course, is that anybody can pick up his stuff and start, you know, hacking in day one. I reckon even I could do it if I put my mind to it and had a weekend and a couple of bottles of wine. You know, I could probably use Metasploit as well. I think it's that, it's that straightforward. So somebody else had a question down here? Yeah, um, just sort of like on the security of stuff, like in terms of payment gateways, there's news payment gateways like Stripe coming out and there's the sort of PCI compliance around getting those is, is kind of changing as of next year with like the PCI DSS three? SAQ, well three, but the SAQ AEP, I think it is, like versus the SAQ A, like what, when, I'm not entirely sure on when to, I need to get just PCI compliance A versus AEP especially for stuff like Stripe <coughs> and like other sort of API-based payment gateways. Now, I can see you're hoping for a really helpful answer from me on this. <laughs> and I really hate to disappoint. Honestly, I couldn't answer that one directly. You know, um, PCI is not my bag. Sure. It's, we, as, as an organisation, it's not something we're involved in. I know it. I know of it. I'm not any kind of... A, I couldn't give you any guidance on that. I have to say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fail on that one. Um, but, um, you know, reach out to me afterwards. It'd be something interesting. I'd be listening to, you know, please contact me. I'd, I'd love to stay in touch. It's an education for everybody, to be honest. You use these, op I always like to try and use these opportunities as an education on both sides, because a question unanswered is one that I want to know the answer to at the end of the day, right? Because I don't want to stand here looking stupid. Um, but no, good question. I can't answer it, but do, you know, ask it again in writing. Right. <laughs> Simple words, two or three syllables. We'll be all right. That's it. I like TLAs. Anyone else? These other questions. Just two, two other recommendations, just for anyone who's not heard of them. Um, so, for those who use Rails on the back end, um, a guy called Ali Najaf runs a Rails security workshop. It's a one day workshop where you go about using popular exploits on like a dummy Rails app in order to go in and steal a secret from it. And that's very eye opening. It's just how easy. It is to get a secret out of Rails app. And then a point he made, which has stuck with me to this day, is that there's no real, there's no such thing as um, security and obscurity. When a new vulnerability pops no. up, somebody is going to try and use it on every IP address, every every IP address on the internet. So your server is going to have it run against it at some point. You know, you know, you know when you see these weird log messages that say, you don't know, a WordPress hack or something like that. Yeah. It's not a random occurrence. No. So you will, every exploit will be tried against your server at some point. You need to be ready for all of them. So uh, ten years ago, security through obscurity, there was something in it. Smaller companies, etc. Now, 
I think something like 80% of all attacks are against smaller companies, actually targeted attacks, not you know, sweeping across. They sweep across and find a target and then we'll go and attack it properly. But small companies are actually a significant uh, number, or smaller companies are a significant uh, statistic of, of uh, and subjects of an attack. Sorry, yes? Is the HVAC company? Yeah, so then they get physical access and then they do. I think the uh, HVAC one, it was it, um, so was it a spear fishing attack? I'm not sure. No, you're absolutely right. The, in, the insider threat. I totally agree. And I think, you know, perhaps what I should have emphasized and I didn't is that, you know, um, it's not all your fault. All right. It's not all down to bad coding or anything like that. <clears throat> the significant threat is for the insider threat. Um, now, the insider threat means, it's, you know, that you've got a threat actor inside who will then attack your... SQL server through a SQL injection attack, if you see what I mean. So just because it's sitting inside doesn't mean you can be lazy about coding, if you see what I mean. But the actual source of the attack, that means they've, got, they've already got access to these things in the first place. But it's like, and I don't like the term, you know, the onion skin approach to defense in depth. I mean, it's a little bit dated. It shouldn't really be like that. It's, um, but if you can s stop them at the first hurdle, you know, then you're, well, well for a start, you've got a, you know, a clean bill of health straight away if you see what I mean. It should be, rather than having to have defense in depth and having, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten layers of different things to get through, just secure by design. Just make it secure in the first place. And then there wouldn't be these sequence of vulnerabilities, <coughs> even if they are, um, uh, uh, even if they are sort of spear phishing attacks or password reuse, you know, by making sure you can't have password reuse across multiple systems is security by design. You know, the, the um, social engineering attacks by making sure that people are trained to recognize social engineering attacks is security by design. It doesn't have to be code or technology, it can be awareness as well. Um, so yeah, if, if I gave the impression that actually it's all your fault, that's not the case in at all. You play an important part alongside with everybody else. I say you as developers. I'm assuming everybody here is a developer, right? Am I the only one who's not? Oh, lovely. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's it's but it's it's an important and vital role uh, that, that that we play in this. Thanks. Okay, another hand. Thank you very much.